Chapter 19 Treasure Unbelievable riches. He couldn't believe the contents of the survival pack. The night before he was so numb with exhaustion. He couldn't do anything but sleep. All day in the water had tired him so much that, in the end, he'd fallen asleep sitting against his shelter wall, oblivious even to the mosquitoes, to the night, to anything. But with false gray dawn, he'd awakened, instantly, and began to dig in the pack, to find amazing, wonderful things. There was a sleeping bag, which he hung to dry over his shelter roof on the outside, and foam sleeping pad, an aluminum cook set with four little pots and two frying pans. It actually even had a fork and knife and spoon, a waterproof container with matches, and two small butane lighters, a sheath knife with a compass in the handle, as if a compass would help him, he thought, smiling, a first aid kit with bandages, and a tube of antiseptic paste and small scissors, a cap that said Cessna across the front in large letters. Why a cap? He wondered. It was adjustable, and he put it on immediately, a fishing kit with four coils of line, a dozen small lures and hooks and sinkers. Incredible wealth. It was like all the holidays in the world, all the birthdays there were. He sat in the sun by the doorway where he had dropped the night before and pulled the presents, out one at a time to examine them, turn them in the light, touch them, and feel them with his hands and eyes. Something that at first puzzled him. He pulled out what seemed to be a broken off bulky stock of a rifle, and he was going to put it aside thinking it might be for something else in the pack. When he shook it, and it rattled, after working at it a moment, he found the butt of the stock came off, and inside there was a barrel and a magazine and action assembly with a clip and a full box of 50 shells. It was a 22 survival rifle. He'd seen one once in the sporting goods store where he went for bike parts, and the barrel screwed onto the stock. He'd never owned a rifle, never fired one, but he'd seen them on TV, of course and after a few moments figured out how to put it together by screwing the action on the stock, how to load it, and put the clip full of bullets into the action. It was a strange feeling holding the rifle. It somehow removed him from everything around him. Without the rifle, he had to fit in, to be part of it all, to understand it and use it. The woods, all of it, with the rifle, suddenly, he didn't have to know, didn't have to be afraid or understand. He didn't have to get close to a fool bird to kill it didn't have to know how it would stand if he didn't look at it and moved off to the side. The rifle changed him the minute he picked it up, and he wasn't sure he liked the change very much. He set it aside, leaning against the wall. He could deal with that feeling later. The fire was out, and he used a butane lighter and a piece of birch bark with small twigs to get another one started. Marveling at how easy it was, but feeling again the lighter somehow removed him from where he was. What he had to know, with a ready flame, he didn't have to know how to make a spark nest, or how to feed the new flames to make them grow. As with the rifle, he wasn't sure he liked the change. Up and down, he thought. The pack was wonderful, but it gave him up and down feelings. With the fire going and sending up black smoke and a steady roar from a pitch-smelling chunk he put on, he turned once more to the pack, rummaging through the food packets. He hadn't brought them out yet, because he wanted to save them until last, glory in them. He came up with a small electronic device completely encased in a plastic bag. At first he thought it was a radio or cassette player, and he had a surge of hope because he missed music, missed sounds, missed hearing another voice. But when he opened the plastic and took the thing out and turned it over, he could see that it wasn't a receiver at all. There was a coil of wire held together on the side by tape, and it sprung into a three-foot-long antenna when he took the tape off. No speaker, no lights, just a small switch at the top and on the bottom he finally found, in small print, emergency transmitter. That was it. He turned the switch back and forth a few times, but nothing happened. He couldn't even hear static. So, as with the rifle, he set it against the wall and went back to the bag. It was probably ruined in the crash, he thought. Two bars of soap. He'd bathe regularly in the lake, but not with soap. And he thought how wonderful it would be to wash his hair, thick with grime and smoke dirt, frizzed by wind and sun, matted with fish and foolbird grease. His hair had grown and stuck and tangled and grown until it was a clumped mess on his head. He could use the scissors from the first aid kit to cut it off, then wash it with soap. And then, finally, the food. It was all freeze-dried and in such quantity that he thought, with this, I could live forever. Package after package he took out. Beef dinner with potatoes, cheese and noodle dinners, chicken dinners, egg and potato breakfasts, fruit mixes, drink mixes, dessert mixes more dinners and breakfast than he could count easily. Dozens and dozens of them, 
all packed in waterproof bags, all in perfect shape, and we had them all out and laid against the wall in stacks. He couldn't stand it, and he went through them again. If I'm careful, he thought, they'll last as long as, as long as I need them to last. If I'm careful, no, not yet. I won't be careful just yet. First, I'm going to have a feast. Right here now, I'm going to cook up a feast and eat until I drop, and then I'll be careful. He went into the food packs once more and selected what he wanted for his feast. A four-person beef and potato dinner with orange drink for an appetizer and something called a peach whip for dessert. Just add water, it said on the packages, and cook for half an hour or so until everything was normal size and done. Brian went to the lake and got water in one of the aluminum pots and came back to the fire. Just that amazed him, to be able to carry water to the fire in a pot. Such a simple act, and he hadn't been able to do it for almost two months. He guessed at the amounts and put the beef dinner and peach dessert on to boil, then went back to the lake and brought water to mix with the orange drink. It was sweet and tangy, almost too sweet, but so good that he didn't drink it fast, held it in his mouth, and let the taste go over his tongue, tickling on the sides, sloshing it back and forth, and then down, swallow then another. That, he thought, that is just fine, just fine. He got more lake water and mixed another one and drank it fast, then a third one, and he sat with that near the fire, but looking out across the lake, thinking how rich the smell was from the cooking beef dinner. There was garlic in it, and some other spices, and the smells came up to him and made him think of home, his mother cooking, the rich smells of the kitchen, and at that precise instant, with his mind full of home, and the smell from the food filling him, the plane appeared. He'd only a moment of warning. There was a tiny drone, but as before, it didn't register, then suddenly, roaring over his head low, and in back of the ridge, a bush plane with floats exploded into his life. It passed directly over him, very low, tipped a wing sharply over the tail of the crashed plane in the lake, cut power, glided down the long part of the L of the lake, then turned and glided back, touching the water gently once, twice, and settling with a spray to taxi, and stopped with its floats gently bumping the beach in front of Brian's shelter. He hadn't moved. It all happened so fast that he hadn't moved. He sat with the pot of orange drink, still in his hand, staring at the plane, not quite understanding it yet, not quite knowing yet that it was over. The pilot cut the engine, opened the door, and got out, balanced and stepped forward on the float to hop on the sand without getting his feet wet. He was wearing sunglasses, and he took them off to stare at Brian. I heard your emergency transmitter, then I saw the plane when I came over. He trailed off, cocked his head, studying Brian. Damn, you're him, aren't you? You're that kid. They quit looking a month, no, almost two months ago. You're him, aren't you? You're that kid. Brian was standing now, but still silent, still holding the drink. His tongue seemed to be stuck to the roof of his mouth, and his throat didn't work right. He looked at the pilot, and the plane, and down at himself, dirty and ragged, burned and lean and tough, and he coughed to clear his throat. <clears throat> My name is Brian Robison, he said. Then he saw that his stew was done. The peach whip was almost done and he waved to it with his hand. Would you like something to eat? Epilogue The pilot who landed so suddenly in the lake was a fur buyer mapping Cree trapping camps for future buying runs. Drawn by Brian when he unwittingly turned on the emergency transmitter and left it going. The Cree move into the camps for fall and winter to trap, and the buyers fly from camp to camp on a regular route. When the pilot rescued Brian, he'd be alone on the L-shaped lake for 54 days. During that time, he'd lost 17% of his body weight. He later gained back 6%, but had virtually no body fat. His body had consumed all extra weight, and he would remain lean and wiry for several years. Many of the changes would prove to be permanent. Brian had gained immensely in his ability to observe what was happening and react to it. That would last him all his life. He had become more thoughtful as well, and from that time on, he would think slowly about something before speaking. Food. All food, even food he didn't like, never lost its wonder for him. For years after his rescue, he would find himself stopping in grocery stores just to stare at the aisles of food, marveling at the quantity and the variety. There were many questions in his mind about what he'd seen and known, and he worked at research when he got back, identifying the game and berries. Gut cherries were termed choke cherries and made good jelly. The nut bushes where the fool birds hid were hazelnut bushes. The two kinds of rabbits were snowshoes and cottontails. The fool birds were ruffled grouse, also called fool hens by trappers for their stupidity. The small food fish were bluegills, sunfish, and perch. The turtle eggs were laid by a snapping turtle, as he had thought. The wolves were timber wolves, which aren't known to attack or bother people. 
The moose was a moose. There were also the dreams. He had many dreams about the lake after he was rescued. The Canadian government sent a team to recover the body of the pilot, and they took reporters, who naturally took pictures and film of the whole campsite, the shelter, all of it. For a brief time, the press made much of Brian, and he was interviewed for several networks. The fur died within a few months. A writer showed up who wanted to do a book on the complete adventure, as he called it. But he turned out to be a dreamer, and it all came to nothing but talk. Still, Brian was given copies of the pictures and tape, and looking at them seemed to trigger the dreams. They weren't nightmares. None of them was frightening, but he would awaken at times with them. Just awaken and sit up and think of the lake, the forest, the fire at night, the night birds singing, the fish jumping. Sit in the dark alone and think of them. And it wasn't bad, and it would never be bad for him. Predictions are for the most part ineffective. But it might be interesting to note that had Brian not been rescued when he was, had he been forced to go into hard fall, perhaps winter, it would have been very rough on him. When the lake froze, he would have lost the fish, and when the snow got deep, he would have trouble moving at all. Game becomes seemingly plentiful in the fall. It's easier to see with the leaves off the brush, but in winter it gets scarce, and sometimes simply non-existent, as predators like fox, lynx, wolf, owls, weasels, fisher, marten, and northern coyotes sweep through areas and wipe things out. It's amazing what a single owl can do to a local population of ruffled grouse and rabbits in just a few months. After the initial surprise and happiness from his parents at him being alive, for a week it looked as if they might actually get back together. But things rapidly went back to normal. His father returned to the northern oil fields, where Brian eventually visited him, and his mother stayed in the city, worked at a career in real estate, and continued to see the man in the station wagon. Brian tried several times to tell his father, came really close once to doing it, but in the end never said a word about the man, or what he knew, the secret.